Salutations and fist bumps, folks. Welcome back to the grid. And all right, this episode gives us clear indication on how the humans went from scroll saviors to enemy number one. The episode starts with a flashback to Fury's first encounter with the scrolls, which reminds us that the scrolls have been a nomadic race and seeking refuge on Earth for a very long time. However, something I want to point out that stuck out to me was when Captain Rambo says, They won't be safe here. They need to long home. Which is also a slight nod back to Far From Home when the Skrulls were actually still being apprehended or hunted by the Kree secretly. This is two years after the events of Captain Marvel. Vara then introduces a young Gravik to Fury. Oh, and by the way, Vara is actually a name that comes from the New Avengers comics of 2015. And that name was given to a scroll or a Kree scroll hybrid inside of the comics, who was one of the Knights of the Infinite, who was saved by Young Avengers, Hulkling and Wiccan, which by the way, Hulkling is half scroll. Vara isn't listed in any of the credits that I've seen, but we do understand that Priscilla Fury is played by Charlene Woodard and Vara sounds and looks in terms of stature just like her. Gravik has lost his entire family, specifically his parents, in the battle against the Kree, which again, we saw that in Captain Marvel. Fury actually makes mention to the fact that Gravik is just a child and Vara actually says, Only to human eyes. Just talk to him. Which basically says to me, scrolls have a different lifespan on Earth than what they would actually have on New Skrullos, which is also a nod to what Talos says in the first episode. And that means that they mature at a different rate or mature faster, possibly, which also then means we can then look at Gaia in the same lens because what she experienced in terms of seeing people shot and killed in front of her, possibly means that what she perceived of that situation was brought in by different or a more mature mind than we might have thought looking at her from the outside looking in. Fury then explains that the Earth is facing major threats that he needs help defending, which for the scrolls means that they would have to put on a new face and keep it for the long haul. Then Fury asks a very pertinent question to the entire room, who is going to take the pledge first? The way that they talked about her, Soren is the first one to step up. Fury then makes the hugest promise the entirety of the MCU over has seen when he pledges to find the scrolls a new home. But I wanna point out something very key here. Follow me, follow closely, because this is the crux of the entirety of what this series and this episode is about. When Fury makes that promise, he looks directly at Gravik. It isn't a focal point, but he looks directly at him. And then when the camera turns to him, it turns and zooms in. Whatever Gravik has experienced up until this point, Fury is saying that I got you and whatever you've gone through so far or going to go through in the future has to now come through me. This is the reason why Gravik is so upset at the fact that the promise that Fury made was not kept. Because since he lost his parents, Fury is basically his father figure at this point. And I had to go back and double check, but the way that Gravik expresses his emotions when Pagan tells him that Fury is actually in Moscow. Fury's in town, Jay. Is he? It made me think that there was something underlying to that, and now I understand it's because of this. We then cut directly to the aftermath of the bombing. And the first thing that I noticed in this scene is how Gaia now looks at Gravik, because the way that she's looking at him is basically saying, I'm not exactly sure what just happened or why it happened to this extreme. And it sowed a seed that possibly she might defect a little earlier than we thought. We are then taken to an establishing shot 
of a train. And inside of this train, we are now greeted with Russian guards. They are met by a woman inside of a car who tells them that finding a black man in Moscow, specifically on a way on a train going to Warsaw is about as likely as seeing an alien on the same train, which is very ironic because at the same time, they are literally talking to a shape-shifting alien and Fury is in the back. Behind Fury, there's a sign that says from Moscow to Warsaw. And the name of the train actually translates to Soaring Owl. Fury then makes mention of Detroit, which the way that he said that, well, me and my mama used to take the long train rides to Detroit. Sounds like he either spent a lot of time or lived there for a moment because folks that are native from Detroit do not elongate the E in Detroit. And I only know this because my wife is an actress and has spent a good amount of time with a dialect coach specifically for the stage. He then goes on to further explain the world in a segregated situation, specifically for travel. And we couldn't go in the dining car. So we brought fried chicken, white bread, deviled eggs, pound cake, and a shoebox. Half hour after the train pulled out, that chicken be gone. Anyone that comes from a black household understands verbatim how wonderful that meal actually is. In the story, he actually makes a reference to Old Man Jackson, which feels like a reference directly to him. And when I say him, I mean Samuel L. Jackson, if you didn't know. But inside of this moment, towards the end, Fury's demeanor and the way that he describes the rest of this story actually changes from a jovial memory to a inquisitive interrogation. The mere fact that I did that told her everything she needed to know about me and Susie. Mm -hmm. Which then is fully uncovered when he opens the floor to play the same game with Talos. Talos then tells Fury, you know, see what had happened was we was trying to ward off the Kree as much as we possibly can, but then we got overpowered by them and then we left. And when we left, the million that were with me all came flooding on down and spread out across the universe. Fury then pokes that bear a little bit more, to which Talos spills the beans and says, all of them are on Earth. And this moment was probably the best moment in the earlier part of this episode for me when Fury says Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You, you're, you're telling me there's a million scrolls walking amongst us right now? Have you lost your reptilian ass mind? Ah, classic Sam Jackson. Doesn't get much better than that. Well, Fury is shocked and says that Talos lied to him because what he believed was that all of the scrolls that were on Earth, the little handful that he thought were on Earth, were the handful in that room. So again, I bring back the promise that Fury made to the scrolls. They're lying about being or how many are there, and Fury is lying about the fact that he could eventually find them a home. But Fury says, you knew how to get in touch with me. Similar to the way that Captain Marvel understood how to get in touch with him through the pager, Talos had access to that same information. We saw that he knew how to get in touch with Fury because in Far From Home, we actually saw him get in touch with Fury. We then cut to the car scene for Gravik and Gaia as they are now going to the Squirrel Council meeting. And in this exchange, you can see that Gaia is no longer fully trustworthy of Gravik. When she asks him, how did you know that Fury was going to be there? And basically what that sounds like or what she's probing for is how on earth did you get all this intel and not share it with anyone in our camp? He deflects and responds by saying, 
I didn't, I just guessed. He also then makes mention that he wanted to see what was left of the man. Again, going back to the fact that Gravik looks at Fury like a father figure. Gaia is actually told to stay back, which to her demeanor and face is like, nah, 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 nah. That ain't happening, fam. Because again, what she's trying to portray is that she's loyal to Gravik. That becomes very paramount later on in the episode. Gravik then responds and says, if he does anything weird, shoot him in the head. Choosing violence on a random Tuesday? <laughs> Gravik responds or greets each of the dignitaries in this room, but one person that he does not do this with is Shirley. Madam Prime Minister. Hello, Shirley. He looks directly at her and says her name. So for me, when I first encountered this scene, I thought that Shirley was a goner. Gravik then sits down at the council table and then makes a remark about how the council members have become really accustomed or should I say lavished with all of their amenities that they now have in terms of their stature, power, clothes, what they eat, what they drink. I see you all dressed up in the man's finery, drinking the man's wine, playing the man's game, using the man's fork and knife. Better to behave as a human than as a dog. Gravik then says that he actually likes dogs because they're not hypocrites. I mean, yeah, that's kind of true because dogs don't talk. They can't be hypocrites if they don't talk. So that makes sense. <laughs> but in terms of that hypocrites situation, he could be talking about the people in this room because all of them at this point are now basically saying that what they want and what they're experiencing are two different things. Because again, when he makes mention of the wine and all the clothes that they have access to now, they don't wanna give that stuff up. So they could be becoming hypocritical scrolls at this point, which by goodness, just saying it out loud is a thing that I didn't even understand until I said it. Gravik also then makes mention of the fact that dogs don't put other dogs in cages similar to the way that humans put humans in cages. And this is a, a nod to something that actually happened in the real world, but I won't go into that too far. Oh. And then one of the council members actually says that's a really trivial history lesson about human. And there's one other person in the MCU that had a similar outlook on all of this, and that was Ultron. That's too much. Oh, no. You are in distress. No. Gravik then takes center stage and soapboxes a little bit here. <laughs> And when you know, the first thing out of his mouth is the fact that the promise that was made to them was not kept. Fury abandoned them, the humans then cast them aside. And this whole scene was just filled with a lot of tension and all that kind of stuff. It was palpable and all that and good on them. However, this one thing stayed with me after I saw it. That one thing is Gravik forcing his war cry inside of this scene. I mean, listen to this. I think it's a war. I think it's a war. Hmm? That felt forced, didn't it? Same for me. And then asks for blind faith to be placed inside of him. Yay. He then cuts directly to the prime minister and she says, We need a single commander whose war power is total and unchecked. That's exactly what Gravik is and that's exactly what he wanted to hear in the first place. And in the same situation, another council member actually voices his opinion standing up to which one of the guards walks behind him, Roth chops that ninja, and then Gravik basically takes it upon himself to say, sit your insides down, I'm not done. But all those in favor of Gravik then becoming Skrull General uncloak themselves and take on their Skrull format, which again, 
all of the red flags that I have were raised beforehand, but they screaming now, fam. We then see a very dope shot of Gravik from behind his chair, which basically gives us a good glimpse of the entire room with Shirley not standing up and not uncloaked at this point. She is not for the foolishness that Gravik is actually trying to play here. And I thought for sure she was about to get shot. However, Gravik actually lets her leave, which again, I was not expecting. Shirley then promptly calls Talos. And inside of this conversation, basically what the summation of it is, is Shirley tells Talos that Gravik is unhinged and Shirley says, Talos, you're going to get yourself killed. Talos then says, I don't give a flying fluff about any of that. Set up the meeting because all he wants is to speak to his daughter. Pagon then dips off to a back room to which Gaia follows him. And as she follows him, we find out that where he's going is actually a laboratory. And we then see that there's a woman or a scientist that is in that room. And specifically her name is Dr. Rosa Dalton, who by the way, the real Dr. Dalton is stuck inside of a scroll fracking pod. So that means that the woman that he is talking to is a squirrel. But when seeing him, Dr. Dalton says, you don't have it. But then Pagon actually says the harvest wasn't there, which by the way, the harvest in the comics was a member of the flanks who were responsible for the capture of all of the new generation mutant. Once upon a time, he was a human who volunteered to become a part of the flanks program when they were using living Sentinel. Pagan then says that he will send out more teams for the harvest, but their fearless leader could be possibly wrong in some cases. And this is again, throwing stones in the chinks in the armor of Gravik because this is now showing that Pagan doesn't necessarily believe in what is going on either. We then cut to a scene with Rhodey meeting with the UN and the emergency meeting is called because of what happened in Moscow with Nick Fury and Maria Hill and they want to know why. Rhodey then says those are just allegations. Rhodey catches the Slovakian rep rolling her eyes multiple times to which he says <laughs> Slovakia rolls its eyes at me one more time I'm gonna put on the suit and carpet bomb it swiftly that actually or a similar situation actually happened in Infinity War to Thanos's army after that meeting Fury then calls Rhodey and inside of this exchange between the two of them this reminded me of Taken so much in this exchange we understand that Fury has a vantage point on Rhodey that he nor anyone else has an idea of where but he knows that he's somewhere close. Fury is actually so detailed on this call that he actually asks Nice suit Armani <sighs> Brioni and then more specifically saying that that suit in particular is very expensive for a government salary. And they settle on a 1 p.m. meeting at a tavern. When Fury arrives, he actually makes a joke literally after hitting the door about being poisoned by the drink that Rhodey presents to him and then asks, are the Russians trying to pin this on me? To which Rhodey explains and really lays out the fact that his face is all over CCTV. So yes, they in fact are trying to pin it on you. And after Rhodey says that they're the ones taking the bullet, he Fury then responds and says, no, 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 I'm not talking about anyone domestic or foreign or that at at that point at all i'm talking non-state actors more on a universal scale Rhodey then replies hydra like wait we got those guys way back in the beginning of all this what are you even talking about and if you don't remember yes hydra did infiltrate into shield without 
anyone knowing, which is exactly what is happening with the scrolls here. Rhodey promptly, in the midst of their conversation, fires Fury, which I was not expecting at all. And as Fury is about to leave, and he actually gets very spicy with one of the guards that is holding the door at this point, and grabs his gun, and one of the best lines inside of this episode scene whatever possibly in the mcu to date is i'm nick fury even when i'm out i'm in say it with me little cat <laughs> yes sir we then cut to the meat market where brogan is being held he is now being held by none other then Sonia Fallsworth. And in this scene, she actually cuts off his finger, which for me made me think of the newer version of Secret Invasion. Inside of that situation, Maria Hill actually devises or comes up with a plan to figure out who and where scrolls are by taking samples of their blood and having it analyzed. And if it comes up green, it's a scroll. Aside from She-Hulk, that aside, because her green, her blood is gonna be green regardless, her blood and Bruce's blood for that matter. We cut back to Gaia doing some snooping work around the computers where she saw Pagan go into the room before. And on that computer, she actually sees a list of DNA types and one of them happens to belong to Groot. Then we get one of the most epic fight scenes I've ever seen inside of the MCU, specifically starting with a sync shot. And that made me think of video games like Army of Two, The Last of Us, even Splinter Cell in some cases. Gaia then sneaks off disobeying the stay in the car directive that Gravik actually gave her, she sneaks off and makes a phone call to what I believe were the police, giving the location and everything else about the drop zone that they were going to go back to. <laughs> She's speaking Russian in this case, not English, so she's not talking to her father. Then, after all the fighting is over, we get a, another picture of Gravik and the rest of the gang inside of the taxi. And then we get another glimpse of the discontentment between Gravik and Gaia in this situation, because as he continues to tell her to keep driving, she kind of cuts a look at, at him and he deathly stares at her, basically saying, I know that you did this, but I'm not gonna call you on it right now. Then towards the end of the episode, we get a heart-wrenching moment again, but we all understand what's about to happen here because although this is slightly a throw off to the fact that Gravik is making a statement here to Gaia, unfortunately, Brogan is now gone. Also, while watching this shot in slow motion at this point, if you pay close attention to the background, inside the car you can kind of see a silhouette of Gravix scroll form or at least what looks like a silhouette of his scroll form in the background in the car behind Gaia once she hears the gunshot it's kind of a foreshadowing that their relationship is very strenuous if not broken already we see a scroll woman which at this point is known to be Priscilla Fury. My first, and I, I kid you not, the thing that came out of my mouth the first time that I saw this was Harpo, who this woman? Cause bruh, when in the world did Fury have time to get married? I strongly now believe, and now this is confirming it, that when he was dusted, he was thinking, about this woman. The irony of the song choice in the background here is Try A Little Tenderness by Otis Redding. And my goodness, is that a perfect song choice because the undertones of all of this is that Fury, once he steps through that door, he is no longer Nick Fury. He is a husband and that is it. He 
cannot look at her the same way that he looks at the other rebel scrolls so he has to use tenderness in everything that he's doing up until he leaves that house look here now i know that you have a lot more questions about episode three now that we've talked about all of this inside of episode two so here's what i need you to do click or tap right here go ahead and hit it it'll explain all of the things inside of episode three wow you're still here i'll be here in the words of cap i can do this all day